Okay, thank you very much. Um, unlike our North American colleagues, I work in Europe. Um, I'm actually going to uh, largely restrict my discussion to drugs which are actually available to us in Europe. I'm going to push the boat out a little bit because there's quite a lot of treatments I can't use in Scotland. Um, but um, I was also asked just before I sat down if I was going to show you the genomic predictor that tells us how to treat these patients. Well, uh, it would be a fairly obscure corner of the ECHO program to hide it if I was. Um, so these are my disclosures. Um, okay, well, the first question is, do we actually treat everyone the same? Um, so um, these, I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to vote on this in a minute, but um, these are two cases. And I think for those of you who are oncologists in the audience, I think these two cases are fairly familiar to you. Case one is a 76-year-old man. Um, he had metastatic disease at diagnosis, but that was five years ago. Um, he had intermediate grade disease at that time, and he's now failed dual androgen blockade. So he's had bicalutamide plus an LHRH agonist. He's asymptomatic. His PSA doubling time is quite long, 12 months, and he's got relatively low volume disease. He's definitely got bone metastases, but there are only four on a bone scan. Um, he has ischemic heart disease, which isn't particularly bothersome, and he's a type 2 diabetic. And I'm sure this is a very familiar kind of picture. Maybe the most exceptional thing about this man is the length of time uh, since his diagnosis and the duration of his response to initial hormone therapy. Case two, who we'll refer to as the young guy, depends where you're looking at it from. Um, <clears throat> so uh, he's 65. Um, he also had metastatic disease at diagnosis just a year ago. He had high-grade disease. He had pattern five Gleason disease at diagnosis. And he's also now failed dual androgen blockade. He is symptomatic. He has mild anorexia and a degree of fatigue and he also has some back pain, which undoubtedly is coming from his bone metastases. And he's got a relatively rapid PSA doubling time of two months. Uh, on imaging, he has multiple bone, but also liver metastases. But he has no comorbidities. Um, now, as I said, um, we're very restricted in what we can use. And I'm going to give you two options, really. Um, you can either give this patient docetaxel, with a view to giving him either abiraterone or enzalutamide afterwards, because both those drugs are, have marketing approval in that indication in Europe. Or we can give him abiraterone prednisolone first, with a view to giving him docetaxel when he fails. Um, so um, this is the voting question, uh, and I want you to vote for how you treat both of these patients all in one go. So if you want to give the p patient one, that's the old guy, uh, abiraterone, first, and you want to give the other guy, the young guy, docetaxel first, it's number one. It's the other way around, it's number two. But if you want to treat them both the same with docetaxel, that's option three. And if you want to treat them both the same with abiraterone, that's option four. Uh, so could you cast your votes, please? Aha. So I can stop now, Mr. Chairman, because we have the answer to the question. We don't treat them all the same. Uh, and so let's explore a little bit um, about what that means. So what we're saying here is that the young guy with the visceral metastases and the symptoms gets docetaxel up front, uh, whereas the other guy gets abiraterone up front. So let's have a little look at why we're saying that. Um, this is uh, Dr. Scher's walking biomarker test, I guess. So let's look back at the case. So first off, one's young, one's old. But they're not that different in age, and I hope we'll all agree that age by itself is not an indicator, a predictor of whether a patient will or will not benefit from treatment. We do know that comorbidities co-segregate to a degree with age, and that comorbidities may well, to some extent, dictate our willingness to give certain therapies, largely due to the anticipated tolerability rather than the anticipated efficacy. What about this, um, I guess we're also thinking, well, patient one, the old guy, he um, had uh, a, a good response to first-line hormone therapy. The second guy had a relatively poor response. But actually, that's not much worse than average uh, for a guy with visceral metastases. Um, 
And I guess that brings us on to the pattern of the disease. Maybe the fact that patient two has visceral metastases is in some way influencing our decision to give him chemotherapy as opposed to the abiraterone up front. We also know, I guess we have a feel that maybe patient one has a slightly less aggressive form of the disease. His PSA doubling time is longer and he had m intermediate grade disease at diagnosis, whereas patient two had high grade disease. So these are the factors which I'm guessing are weighing on our decision to treat these two patients differently. So how would we really like to, what would we really like to know? So let's talk first about prognostic markers. So um, we know uh, that all of these factors uh, in case two add up to a poor prognosis. We know that having short duration of response to initial therapy, high grade disease, symptoms, rapid PSA doubling time, and liver metastases are poor uh, are indicators that this patient is not going to do well. And we've heard at this meeting other, fa other factors, that some many of which we already knew about, such as performance status, opiate use, albumin, hemoglobin, LDH, alkaline phosphatase, and baseline PSA can also, to a degree, indicate a poor prognosis. Uh, but of course, the uh, important thing is that these are prognostic markers, and that means these are markers of outcome, but they're markers of outcome independent of the treatment that we give them. And that's an important point to make. These are prognostic. They do not, in themselves, help us decide whether or not the patient's going to respond to a given treatment. So can we predict uh, do, do these clinical factors help us to predict benefit? So if we look at predictive markers, so a predictive marker, conversely, is a marker which predicts whether or not an individual patient sitting in front of you will or will not benefit from a specific therapy. And one of the great successes in oncology and drug development in the last few years uh, is the generation of this list of, um, of targets, uh, such as HER2 her in uh, uh, predicting response to trastuzumab in breast cancer, uh, down to most recently, I guess, the ALK4 mutations predicting response to crizotinib in non-small cell lung cancer. I'd point out that most of these are targets which are intuitively linked to the drug um, and that they are related uh, and that these are molecularly targeted agents. Maybe the slight exception being the MGMT methylation profile um, predicting response to temozolomide in glioma. Um, but we don't have any of these indicators in prostate cancer at the moment. Uh, and I guess if we're trying to help us with our clinical dilemma here, we don't have even any trials that directly compare docetaxel with any of these newer hormone agents. And so it would be very difficult to be able to understand which patients will and will not respond to the different therapies. But what we do have is we have pre-planned pre subgroup analyses. And um, I'm grateful for Dr. Sartor for showing us a few of these on the way. Now, I would caution what I'm about to show you, um, uh, that these pre-planned subgroup analyses are, at best, hypothesis generating. Um, and so I thought I'd take a couple of these, predict these, these, these clinical factors that we've been, uh, we've been concerned about in our patient. Um, and could la I've largely chosen these because they have been reported in a lot of the trials that uh, Dr. Sato elegantly described for us. Um, and um, I would also caution, um, these are hazard ratios for death from the different trials. The purpose of this table is not to make cross comparisons between trials. Uh, these are the data that, um, uh, that Dr. Sato showed us. These are the overall hazard ratios for survival in each of these five trials. Um, uh, and if, if we look at pain, um, all of these trials did, did pre-planned subgroup analyses on whether the patient had significant pain at entry. The definitions varied, sub varied somewhat, and, and remember that the 302 study restricted was, was restricted to patients with, uh, with, with minimal or no pain. Uh, and what you see is that, that in all of these trials, you're seeing a positive effect irrespective of whether or not the patient had pain. If we look at the presence of visceral disease, now not all of the trials reported this. It wasn't a pre-planned subgroup analysis in Tropic. And of course, remember, pay in the 302 study, patients weren't permitted entry if they had visceral disease. Uh, but again, what we see is that irrespective of whether or not you have visceral disease at baseline, we're still seeing a positive effect in the hazard ratio. Now, 
you may say are, ah, but irrespective of whether you have of which endpoint you look at, and irrespective of which drug you look at, you're having less benefit if you have pain at baseline proportionately, and proportionately less benefit if you have visceral disease at baseline. Uh, but of course, that isn't the same as saying that it doesn't predict for response. So I would conclude uh, from these ob observations uh, that neither pain nor the presence of visceral disease at baseline predicts for the activity of any of these agents. And therefore, nor do they really help us choose which agent to use given the current data. So do clinical criteria help us to choose therapy? Well. I think to an extent they do. Clearly, most of us in this room are choosing therapy based on clinical criteria because I didn't give you the genomic data. Um, so uh, but how do they help us? Well, they help us because to some degree they give us a sense of urgency. The prognosis is sometimes important in how you choose the sequence of the therapy you, that you use. And for example, it can be very helpful in choosing adjuvant therapy, where we know that it's all about the, the relative risk reduction. And so if a patient has very little risk of relapse, it doesn't mean the drugs don't work, but that their risk is so small that the benefit of giving those drugs may be, may, may, may be insignific insignificant. Um, but of course, it may also help us choose uh, not so much who we treat, but when we treat them. And I'm just going to show you some interesting data. These are even worse than pre-planned subgroup analyses. These are po this is a post hoc subgroup analysis from the IMPACT trial. This was the trial of the pivotal trial for Cipulucel T, comparing it with um, what was probably a placebo treatment. Um, uh, and what we see from this is this, this, this is, a, as I say, it's an unplanned subgroup analysis. Uh, and in this analysis, they divided the patient group into four. They put them in order of their PSA at baseline, a known prognostic factor. Um, and they put them, and they divided them into quartiles. So this quartile is the patients who had the 25% the, the, the of patients at the bottom of that range. That was a PSA of less than 22.1. And this quartile was the patients with the, the, the quarter of patients with the highest PSA at baseline. And what you see, again, is you see that the hazard ratio is favorable across all groups. But you do see the size of the survival gain here is 13 months. Uh, compared with 2.8 months in the later disease setting. And that may have something to do with the way that immunotherapy works. But I caution again, it is an unplanned subgroup analysis. And I think we have to say we can draw no real conclusions from that. Uh, and it shouldn't actually enable us to choose which patients, uh, how, how we choose therapy for patients. But I think it certainly may be worth further attention in further trials. So what about molecular predictors? I've already told you I don't have the answer. And in fact, we have relatively few high quality randomized prospective data about molecular predictors. But I do want to show you one set of data. And I'm very grateful to my colleague, uh, Gert Attard, uh, from the Institute for Cancer Research for sharing some of this information with me. Um, so uh, we know that prostate cancer um, has, is a very molecularly heterogeneous disease. We know there are multiple lesions in known cancer genes. And as Howard's already said, many of these are acquired as the disease progresses. If you do ge genetic profiling of m biopsies from metastatic castration-resistant disease, they don't match precisely the biopsies taken at baseline. And that's a problem. That's a challenge we face. Some of these lesions are highly prevalent. Uh, maybe to, uh, to, to highlight a few, because they're coming to trials near you soon, um, P10 loss is very common in prostate cancer. Uh, and other mutations in, in the PI3 kinase pathway are also highly prevalent in prostate cancer. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, there are a lot of drugs which target these pathways in clinical development. P53, maybe more because actually it is rarely mutated in prostate cancer, at least if we look at the bi bi baseline biopsies from these patients. And again, there are some trials coming to you soon uh, which are targeting the P50, the normal P53 pathway. But I guess probably the best known and best characterized molecular lesion in prostate cancer is the, uh, is, is the temporous ERG rearrangement. And that's common, and it is also associated with poor prognosis. 
Um, this is the Q302 study, that's the pre-chemotherapy study of abiraterone, and we've already discussed this trial in some detail already, so I won't go over that again. Uh, but as part of this study, there was a prospective tissue collection program. This was not fresh biopsies, this is just the patient's diagnostic tissue by and large. Uh, there were 1,088 patients enrolled in the trial. Uh, interestingly, we only to managed to obtain tissue samples in 494 of them. That's pretty good for a trial like this, but it's just a highlight of the to highlight the problems we face in doing this research. Uh, and in fact, of those 494 tissue samples, only three of 342 of them were suitable for the marker analysis that, 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 that Gert performed. Um, and uh, without going into great detail about ERG rearrangements, there are a number of rearrangements that are found. Um, but 65.5%, so two-thirds of the patients, had no ERG rearrangement. Um, whereas the th a third of patients had an ERG rearrangement. But there's this particularly, if you like, potent rearrangement which involves m duplication um, of the rearranged gene but also a deletion in the ERG portion of the, uh, of the fusion gene. Um, and that's associated with a particularly poor prognosis. And 50 patients out of the 342 had, um, had, had that, that lesion. And these are the primary data from that trial. <coughs> and, and Gert presented these at, uh, at AS, the main ASCO meeting earlier this year. Um, and what you can see on the left, this is the patients who have that particularly potent mutation, um, translocation um, uh, pr pr present. And so if you remember, this predicts for a poor prognosis, and indeed we see that. Uh, the, the, the median survival in the prednisolone arm uh, was shorter than, uh, than, than seen in those who did not have any rearrangement in the ERG gene. Uh, but there's a suggestion that these patients actually do particularly well um, this is, this is uh, progression, radiographic progression-free survival, uh, that these, these patients maybe did particularly well from the addition of abiraterone. Um, but uh, at present, this is still not really enough to guide us, and I would also point out that even patients with no rearrangement, the majority of patients still had a st significant benefit from this intervention. Um, uh, but this has strengths, it's a pre-specified analysis and it is the largest pre-planned uh, pr predictive biomarker test done in a randomized trial. Um, and it's, uh, but it is based on a, a the radiographic progression-free survival endpoint and we're still not quite certain exactly what that means for our patients. Um, uh, and it is uh, to reiterate that the drug effect is nonetheless preserved across groups. So my conclusion is this is very interesting, uh, but at the moment it is insufficient to guide treatment. So, in summary, um, do we still have to treat everyone the same way? Um, I would say, firstly, that clinical and laboratory markers can provide useful prognostic information, and this informa although this does information, uh, does not predict whether one treatment or uh, may be more effective than another, it may nonetheless impact on our choice and, to some degree, the patient's choice of therapy. Uh, but true predictive markers, which truly define subgroups of patients which respond to given therapies, to this date, remain elusive in prostate cancer. I have to finish with a photo of Scotland. I hope to welcome you to Scotland one day. <laughs>